Hey, man. Can you see me? Yeah. Hey. All right. Yeah. How are you? Good to there see you, you Nikki. What's going on? Here, no, hold on one second. Let me adjust something. Sure. You know, my age, you need all the beauty lights you can get. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what. Yeah. I didn't know, but my wife is officially fucking blind. Like she like looked at me today and she goes, Oh, you look so good. And I've got the poor old lady she lost her eyesight now, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's good to have the wife, it's good to have the, the wife blind in some time of our life, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> probably, probably she's an angel, but by but blind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's good to see you guys. Let's uh, okay. let's talk. Welcome, let's talk. Well, welcome, welcome, Nikki. It's a, a a great pleasure to talk with you uh, in here in Brazil. The Molly Crew is a, is a, a icon band. You are an icon guy here in Brazil. The the archetypal of rock and roller. Um, and congratulations for your your new life in the in the field, uh, living in the mountains. Yeah. It's nice. It's it's very similar to where I grew up before I headed to Hollywood. And I find it a really great place to just be creative, you know. So I'm constantly writing and writing music and painting. And um, it's really good because, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate. We we're out in the middle of, of literally nowhere. I mean, there's, there's a town really called Jackson. It's only 9,000 people. So there is no going to the, the Lakers or go to see the LA Rams or going to the ballet. There's no museum. Yeah. So, you know, you, you do everything outside here and it gets the brain open and free like I was when I was a kid. And then I get to go back to these great cities and uh, tour and, and do stuff. So it's, it's worked out to be a pretty cool thing, you know. Cool. Uh, I, I will introduce you in Portuguese. Uh, and after that, we, we start to talk, all right? Sounds great. Okay. Meu amigo e minha amiga, eu tenho uma dica sensacional para você. É um livro que conta como um cara com a vida desgraçada, miserável, conseguiu montar uma das bandas de maior sucesso de todos os tempos. Eu estou falando desse livro aqui. Ó. Meus primeiros 21, como me tornei Nick Six. Pois é, cara. É o baixista do Molly Crew contando... Como ele conseguiu montar o Molly Crew, tendo uma vida repleta de tragédias, de dureza, de grana, de problemas, de confusões. É um verdadeiro manual de perseverança, vamos dizer assim, mesmo dentro de um universo completamente maluco. E tem, evidentemente, aquele texto completamente sincero do Nick Six. É um livro perfeito para você entender como funcionava também toda aquela época do finalzinho dos anos 70, começo dos anos 80, em termos de show business, o que, que era necessário para vingar naquela época. É um livro muito interessante, ao contrário de outros, que sempre tem aquelas partes que falam da infância, adolescência e juventude, que são muito chatas, aqui não, cara, isso aqui é realmente impressionantemente interessante. E claro que você, evidentemente, tem privilégios aqui no meu canal. Basta que você clique no link abaixo, preencha o cupom de desconto com Registadeu Indica, tudo junto, e você vai poder adquirir esse livro aqui com um incrível desconto. O melhor desconto da internet, eu garanto. Então, não perca essa oportunidade. Meus primeiros 21, como me tornei Nick Six. É um livro que você não vai conseguir parar de ler. Eu garanto. Vamos em frente. Meu amigo e minha amiga, voltamos aqui a trazer entrevistas aqui no meu canal e hoje nós temos o grande prazer, eu e Paulo Barão, de conversar com uma das figuras mais icônicas do rock and roll. Mr. Nick Six, welcome! Hey, man. What's happening? 
<laughs> what, are, what are we going to talk about? Let's talk about some shit. Let's get going. Let's, let's, yeah, all right. Well, so, well, after three books, is so many shit happening, isn't it? No, I just know. talking yeah. about. I know. Uh, it's uh, crazy. Uh, you know, when when the new book came out, and uh, yeah. the editor called me, and he was like, "So, congratulations on your fourth fourth time being on the New York Times list." And you know, you you don't really when you're you're making albums or writing books or doing anything, you kind of like in the moment. You're doing it. We were doing the dirt or when I did the heroin diaries and then this is going to hurt. Everything's kind of in the moment. Then all of a sudden something happens and they're like, you guys have crossed a threshold or, or you personally crossed a threshold. And I, at the same time I heard that about the first 21, um, I'm also working on another book, two books, actually, to be honest with you. One's an art book and one's a children's book. Yeah. Uh, so it. It's interesting, you know, I, I never like set out to be an author. Um, you know, I never, I don't know really what I set out to do. I think I just loved words and I learned to play bass so that I had a way to express myself lyrically, you, you know. Cool. Uh, um, first of all, Nick, uh, congratulations for your 20 and, and, and more, 20 plus years of sobriety and for, and for your uh, courage in re uh, uh, revisiting painful past in your new book, The First 21, yeah. How I Became in Nick Six, uh, uh, documenting your childhood and teenage times and your move to LA where you began your career in music. My first question is pain, suffering, lack of money and frustration were essential elements for you to build a, a strong and aggressive personality to yeah. create Molly Crew uh, uh, in the kind of uh, of revenge against the world that despised you. And these are the elements that apply to any band that wants to be successful in our areas of show business. You know, I... I really discovered in writing the first 21, going back and talking to family members and, you know, aunts and uncles and cousins and um, that, you know, those early years were uh, not really a struggle. They were just, I didn't know any better. My, uh, my mother um, left when I was young. My dad left when I was young. My mom was kind of um, just footloose and fancy free, I guess, is a nice way of saying it. So my grandparents raised me, but my grandfather and grandmother, I don't think they ever even graduated grade school. So we're talking in the 30s, right? Uh, or, or the 40s. And he joined the military when he was 13 years old, which you could do back then, you know, um, he was a merchant marine. And they took me, they took care of me. And, but because he didn't have an education, he didn't officially have a craft he was really good with his hands really good with working on cars so he's kind of a mechanic so we moved from city to city to opportunity to opportunity and I you know I look back on that and it was probably a great gift for me because it made me a little bit to be the new kid in school you, you walk in and they're like hi we have a new kid here and you're like great thanks for pointing it out and then six months later it happens again and six months later it happens again so I, I have my grandmother and my grandfather they were fantastic but there was a, a lack of the traditional family structure and moving and moving and moving I became extremely close to one or two people and then that would kind of get ripped out so I didn't feel that no pain or any type of uh, trauma or anything during that time. I just was like, oh, I miss my friend when I lived in El Paso. Oh, I miss my best friend when we lived in, in the desert in New Mexico. Um, and it's when I started forming band, first hanging out with like-minded people in Seattle and like only about music and fashion and, you know, experimenting with smoking weed, and drinking and the girls. And, and it became about music. It became about the New York Dolls first record. It became yeah. about that first Aerosmith record. It became about Led Zeppelin. It became about the Stones, Patti Smith, you know, um, I became, I found a family in a sense, you know, a musical group gang of misfits. Mm -hmm. And, 
And then I started putting together bands because I had all these words and they, and, and I started playing and I wasn't the best bass player, but I somehow had a great knack for writing songs. And I still to this day write in root notes, just doom, 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 doom. And I'll write whatever the melody line and then the lyrics around that. Um, And then when I, you know, in London, my band London in Los Angeles, I was become like a real family. You know, we were a gang of best friends. All we, we lived and breathed the music like I was in Seattle, but now I was in a band. And when that band disbanded, uh, within only a few months, Botley Crew was formed, and, and it has been my fam, my first family in a sense, uh, consistently for years until I became a father and then built my own family. But the band has always felt like a family to me. And to answer your question, it kind of traces back to those early experiences. Why the ba- why being in a band is so important to me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, I wrote, I read your three books. First, I wrote this, this one. Yeah. And, and my feeling was so weak. I was, you know, so weak for, for many days. But on the final, when I saw all that you passed and I came through your life, yeah. I said, wow, wow. This guy is a typical mushroom guy that really, you know, is, is even that you pass all these things, yeah. but you reinvent it again. And then, right. well, that was the second one that I wrote yeah. for me, okay? And that was so funny. I, yeah, I noticed fun. how, you know, it was fun. You know, how crazy you're being in the, in, in the whole history of Motley Crue. And now, I just finished this one. Yeah. Makes sense. How is it true, Nikki Six? How made you know the wood in the first 21 years yeah. to become the star, the rock, the rock star guy? Your your point of view, how you saw the music in a stairs also with the I mean, also not just iron rod guy who gonna play a guitar. But uh-huh. what I notice is your ideas in show business. How is have to be a rock star? How have to be the stage? How they have to be the fire and all these yeah. kinds of things? How became all this for you in that massive thing is now your business? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, when I was a kid, I was drawn to a lot of stuff uh, in America anyway, and other kids were drawn to around my age, uh, the Munsters, you know, uh, all these like interesting 70s TV shows, the 70s music, you used to have Soul, uh, was it called Soul Station and uh, uh, Dick Clark show, uh, not Dick Clark, um, uh, Anyway, it was, uh, there was like always like this new music coming. There was a thing called Midnight Special. And it was just feeding my imagination. And I never really thought the idea of just being uh, mediocre or being boring seemed like very much fun. I, all the way back to being like a little kid. I remember my grandmother was always sewing and stuff. And I would like show, hey, can you make me these bell bottoms? And she's like... You know, we're in a town of 2,000 people, and I'm like one of only a few of white kids, you know, and it was a great culture to grow up. It was a great group of people to grow up, but I wanted to look different. So a lot of times I got like, you know, got in, a lot, got in fights and stuff because I want to look different. I always liked that idea. So whether it's the stage show, how big can we make it? Or whether it's a song, like where can we push the envelopes or you know it's always about that for me and i i'm lucky like tommy and vince and mick they're the same thing they 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 like the extreme of stuff and it, and it comes through especially live you know you yeah, really yeah. do get to see it live but what i love about the band is uh one of the things i love about the band is you can like the band but you can also um like Mick Mars could be your favorite member of the band or Tommy or Vince or myself. And there's, there's these characters and they're not created. It's not like Nikki's going to be this guy and Tommy's going to be the wild, loud one. And 
it's just these four personalities that accidentally got together all run on the same jet fuel. And, and it's yeah. really cool. You know, we've been uh, the hottest band in the world and we've been like, or no one wanted to touch us and the hottest band in the world, we break up and now we're doing stadiums. And it's because the nucleus of Motley Crue is real. It's real. We don't have to try to fit in. We don't need to be alternative. We don't need to try to be a hip hop band this month. Yeah, we just just Motley Crue, like ACDC, like Metallica. You know, yeah. just stick to who you are. And sometimes you have uh, highs and highs and highs, and sometimes you have lows. But back to an earlier question, I think my youth made me strong. Yeah, it made me strong. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, uh, this is what Nick, I saw it in the book. Yeah. Uh, uh, Nick, uh, for me, everything that happens in childhood and in our time as teenagers remains imprinted in, in our soul and decisively influences what we will be as adults and until, until the end of our life. Yeah. I see in your interview, in your news inter in in interviews uh, uh, and photos in photographs that you, in a certain way, are that boy again, Frank Cotton, yeah. but with all the maturity and survival spirit you have acquired. Yeah. Is it possible to translate this in into your new songs in, in the future that you will make, or do you feel somehow stuck in relation to what Molly Crew uh, represents to the fans? Yeah, I, I believe that um, as a artist, you owe it to your audience to be honest. So I have a two and a half year old daughter right now And she's wonderful. And I'm gonna, I have four older kids. So like, they're like in college and working and doing their life. So it's me and my wife, Courtney and Ruby here. And, you know, I've a few years ago started paying attention again to animation. And not animation, like you go to a movie and these big, like animated shows, like some interesting programming. And now through Netflix, for example, they're really all different age groups. So I started, I developed a, um, excuse me, I'm in the middle of developing with a extremely huge um, animator, uh, uh, director, excuse me, animation director, great production company, great song team. And I'm being honest, I'm developing something because I'm watching my two and a half year old and some messaging and it's about music in the thing. What I will do is write original music for every single episode that will base, be based on that. So the guy sitting out there uh, listening right now goes, what the fuck? That's the guy that wrote Shout at the Devil. And he's right, just like, <laughs> children said, but it's because... When I'm like writing with the guys in Motley Crue, we might be writing about something one of the guys went through or something we noticed in the news. And that's that's real too. But also like this is also a part of my life. And I try to, I try to just live that way. And one of the greatest things for me, I learned a long time ago, and I can always try to pass this on, is the beginner's mindset. So mm -hmm. yeah. If you can keep that, no matter how old you are, if you're 90 and you're like, I want to learn to paint. And it's like, well, great grandpa, you've never painted in your life. You probably shouldn't do that. Yeah, because I'm going to suck at it and I'm not going to be good. And then I'm going to get a little better. And then I'm going to get a little better. And that's life, you know, experiencing life, beginner's mindset. I'm always trying to do that. I'm always trying to learn new stuff or have new experiences. And then I spit it out in a book or in a lyric. All right. You, you right. know what I mean? I'm not trying to relive my life in every single song at that. Like, I'm not trying to be the guy that wrote Bastard. Because I'm not the guy that wrote Bastard. Mm -hmm. I wrote that song about someone that ripped us off. I am the guy that if you fuck with me, I will fuck with you back. And that's what that song yeah. is about. 
You take a swipe at my band, I'll take a swipe at your band. You try to hurt my family, which is my band, I will try to hurt you. That's not something to be proud about. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but you already always do that, right? Yeah, so it's there. It's always That's life. there. That's life. <laughs> That's life. Uh, actually, <laughs> actually, talking about that, uh, regarding the, re the re recent statement you made about per Jam, you, you oh. didn't just like per Jam or also the other artists in the group uh, scene. Uh, what bothered you about that? That was really bothered you in that scene of the grunge? Because probably for you it was so, uh, how can I say, boring, maybe? Well, I mean, listen, I, I remember going on MTV with, Uh, uh, Nevermind before it had come out, Nirvana, and there was a bunch of other bands. Me and Tommy were on there. We're like, hey, you guys got to check out this band. You got to check out this band. And they were like bands that were coming. I remember having a cassette of, a, uh, I think it was demos. It might not have been. It might have been an early record for Rage Against the Machine. And I remember mm -hmm. like telling everybody about that. We've never been afraid to embrace music changing because that's the whole idea behind music. If you listen to Too Fast for Love and then you listen to The Dirt, you're like, well, I, it's the same band, but it has grown, you know, so we've never had a problem with that. My only thing is, what, you want to take a crack at my band, you know, I'm mm -hmm. probably going to say something back. <laughs> <laughs> But what I don't understand is why is the guy even talking about my band? Like he's a successful guy. I mean, listen, let's face it. The guy flies around in private jets. He lives in a mansion in a gated community. He sells out stadiums. And then he dresses at the thrift store and tries to pretend he's some guy in the 90s. <laughs> don't take a swipe at my band, dude. I mean, I'm at least, at least being honest. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, 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 Nick. I, I I also follow your other projects in music. I have the Brides of Destruction album, the 6 a.m. albums, and love LA Rat songs. Yeah, that was fun. Uh, I've been everywhere. That project with uh, uh, Rob Zombie, John Five, and Tommy Clufetus. But I have the impression that you would be the perfect guy to go into a heavy and aggressive electronic field uh, closer to ministry than the, the, the USB stick DJs like uh, David Guetta and other fake guys. Is there, is there really a connection between you and this kind of sound? Uh, what kinds of sound do you love that would totally surprise your fans? <clears throat> Well, first of all, I, I want to say that I am craving, like never before, some such simple, heavy, not produced, raw rock. And I, you know, I told my wife, I go, I, I would love to put together a band, like, like the LA Rats was a good example of a band of just, you know, really cool musicians. Uh, and do a record, but I'm not really prepared to go support that and tour that. So because mm -hmm. of the way that I'm seeing things, and uh, like with the, the children's show and with the children's book and a couple other ideas I have, I'm like, well, you know, how can I apply creating a really weird, raw, dirty band that doesn't, it's not all pro-tooled and auto-tuned, it's just dirty you know it's like what live off the floor you know maybe a couple overdubs um like zeppelin you know like that mm -hmm. like that like some of the t-rex stuff you know some of that early 70s stuff was just you had to be a good player you couldn't just play a little part and then the producer chop it all together i'm really craving that but i need to find a vehicle for it i think it's something that will come out because it's all i do all day is i play these riffs that are like one or two notes And I'm like writing these weird melody lines, but then my wife will walk by, I'll be sitting in bed and she goes, whoa, that's cool. What's that for? I go, I don't know. And then the next day she goes, did you record that? And I go, record what? And then she mm. goes, that, that idea. And I go, I don't, I'm not, 
recording and stuff because I don't have a vehicle, which is probably something I, I need to work, work on. And then as far as what would people uh, be surprised about what I like, I really like, uh, I, I so appreciate a great melody line, just a great melody line. Um, and, you know, some of that R&B, uh, some of the blues, you know, but then you get into this kind of like late 60s, 70s stuff. And the melodies are so good. So because I grew up with, you know, I remember hearing your song by Elton John, and I was just yeah. like, couldn't believe the lyrics, couldn't believe the musicianship. I, I couldn't believe it just, it made my brain explode. And, and things like Kodachrome and Saturday in, the, uh, Saturday in the Park by Chicago. These are big, yeah. big melody things. But I was also kind of like obsessed with Machine Head by Deep Purple and, and this yeah. heavier black sabbath stuff so in my brain they all come together what would people be mm -hmm. surprised they'd be surprised that i could listen to something and really like it because it's really well done but it's nothing that i would ever do you know yeah. I, I don't yeah. really love a lot of contemporary pop grammy award type music it it feels a little too to me overproduced but then you get an artist like pharrell and I think he's mm -hmm. just unbelievable. The lyrics, the uh, you know, the the songwriting, obviously, the 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 whole thing. They're so good. But I yeah. would never. You're not going to hear like, hey, so Nikki Six is doing like a Pharrell project. But <laughs> I, I really appreciate. It. I'd rather do dirty rock and mm -hmm. also listen to this extreme, uh, extremely well written music. Right, but you you always uh, catch it by the melody, always. Yeah, yeah, it's really, I'm, I'm like, how did they think of that? Um, and a lot of stuff that comes out of me, well, I don't know where it comes from, like on Too Fast for Love, when uh, that riff, da 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 mm -hmm. and Vince does that, oh, no, oh, no. Like, I don't know where it came from, but I'm sure it traces back to a bridge in ELO or yeah. something that you would never think. You're like, oh, maybe he got that from the Sex Pistols. No, I probably got it from ABBA. Yeah. Weird, right? Weird. But it's good. Right. If it's good, fuck it's it. Good. It's good. E aí, meu amigo, minha amiga, tá gostando desse papo? Pois é. Saiba que o restante desse material está agora no nosso exclusivíssimo clube de membros, tá ok? Que é um grupo exclusivíssimo. Nele você vai encontrar vídeos com entrevistas, uh, uh, lives personalizadas, uh, matérias especiais, as séries especiais, aposto que você não sabe, os meus três mais, uh, a que falta faz, tudo exclusivíssimo, material que você não vai encontrar no canal do Regis Tadeu normal, tá ok? Para você se tornar um integrante desse grupo seletíssimo, basta que você clique aqui no link abaixo, escolha o seu plano e você vai ter, repito, acesso exclusivíssimo a um monte de materiais e mais uma série de benefícios e toneladas de coisas bacanas, que vão desde descontos de produtos dos nossos parceiros até mesmo visitas ao backstage de shows de artistas nacionais e internacionais tudo exclusivíssimo para você então não esquece clica aqui no link abaixo escolha o seu plano e se prepare porque você vai receber uma avalanche de material inédito que você não vai encontrar no meu canal normal aqui no YouTube, tá ok? Então não perca essa oportunidade.